All right. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to our cumulative 151 and 152 anatomy final. Today we will be kind of breezing through a whole lot of material. We're going to be covering 151 first for a couple hours, then we'll take a short break. We'll come back and cover 152. The file that we're going over is going to be found in the file section of your 152 canvas shell underneath course review material, it'll say exam review material, I think it's 00 is the name of the folder. Once you go into there, it'll say 151 exam review material. From there, you'll be able to find this. I'll also have it linked under announcements in just a moment. So here we go. Let's jump into 151. So the introductory lectures are basically going to be covering um, the definitions of anatomy and physiology. It'll be covering the different levels of structural organization. Um, and the different organ systems of the body, which are going to, um, we're going to basically speak about each one of these in length. It's going to get its own lecture as we go forward. Um, so we're going to talk about tissues. We're going to talk about atoms and how they make chemicals, how chemicals make cells, cells make tissues, tissues make organs, organs make organ systems. And the one thing that we're going to try to keep in mind is that we get an increase in structural complexity as we start gaining to gain function. Basically, every level, we're going to see that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Um, the 11 systems that we're going to be looking at are going to include the integumentary, which is like the hair, skin, and nails, uh, the skeletal system, muscular, nervous system, endocrine system, cardiovascular system, Etc. We're going to be stopping around nervous today, and or not today, 151, and then we'll be picking up with endocrine going forward for 152. Okay. Um, we'll hear me talk about homeostasis quite a lot. Um, in order to be determined to be alive, you have to have several basic life processes, including metabolism, which when we talk about homeostasis, we'll talk about keeping all these metabolic pathways in certain parameters. Um, we have to be able to respond to your external environment, which includes motion towards, say, for example, food or sunlight. You have to be able to grow, differentiate, and eventually reproduce, so make new cells or new organisms or offspring. Um, let's see, am I not moving forward for you guys? No? Sorry, this is where I just did for them. All right, we'll talk extensively about the bodily fluids as well multiple different types of bodily fluids. We talk about the blood plasma and its exchange with the um, extra, um, interstitial fluid, which is going to be the extracellular fluid, as well as the cytoplasmic fluids. We have exchange at all these levels and then exchange back from inside the cell to the external fluid to the blood supply. Um, and we also talked about several different sets of feedback systems throughout the semesters, so you should be able to give me examples of both positive and negative feedback loops. Most of the examples we discussed were negative feedback loops where something disrupts a controlled condition and we want to get it back into homeostatic parameters, so it goes too far high and we want to figure out how to bring it low, or it goes too far low and we want to bring it back high. But we do also have positive feedback loops where we are trying to meet an end goal. For example, the rupture of the uterine follicle, I'm sorry, the ovarian follicle into the releasing the ova into the, the uterine lining, or another example um, of feed forward mechanisms would be the like expulsion of like a splinter or something like that. The end goal is to actually get to whatever our stage is, and then we'll return back to homeostasis by removing something else. Um, so again, negative feedback systems are mainly what we're going to have seen. Maintaining homeostasis, here the examples are homeostasis of blood pressure, for example. Um, but we do see a couple sets of positive feedback systems, particularly relating to childbirth and delivery, right? That's a pretty major classic example. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, the classic example they give for that is, I actually didn't give this yet, would be when we're um, going to be inducing the contractions and labor, and so more pressure on the cervix is going to induce more contractions, is going to induce more pressure, is going to induce more contractions. It's a feed-forward mechanism until something happens, right? The actual delivery of the fetus, for example. And it's the same thing with the, the rupture of the follicle, as I was mentioning, right? They're going to have an LH surge that leads to an estrogen surge that leads to an LH surge, yada, yada. And that's a feed-forward mechanism that finally stops when the follicle ruptures and the ova is released into the uterine tube. So most of the classic things we're looking at are negative feedback loops, and that's because all of the body's goals are to maintain homeostasis in general. And any time that we end up out of homeostatic conditions, this can lead to disease and death. And we use the terms disorder for any time that we are out of our regular homeostatic conditions. So it's going to lead to abnormality of function, sometimes also associated abnormality of structures, et cetera. And so that would be something that's 
characterized as a disorder. Now, if something's characterized as a disease, it's going to basically be a general illness that is going to have recognizable signs and symptoms. And as nurses, you'll have a whole series of diseases that you'll be studying. But there's a couple different types of diseases. It can be either localized, so something that affects a specific part of the body, right, a skin cancer tag in this particular location. Or it can be a systemic disease that affects the entire body or an entire body system, some sort of, for example, like lupus um, or diabetes. And so the disease itself is the illness and characteristics associated with it, but the symptoms are going to be the changes in the body that are associated with this that are not the ones that are able to be actually um, characterized. So we have signs, and again, we have symptoms. Symptoms are something that's self-reported. I feel ill, right? But a sign would be something that you can actually measure, the temperature or a rash or a change in the particular pH or whatever enzyme, et cetera. So symptoms are something that we describe and we take them seriously, but we're not able to measure them. And signs are things that we're able to utilize to characterize the onset or the progression of this disorder. Okay, and then we utilize all of this to make a diagnosis. And that's basically going to help us distinguish one disease from another, right? Um, we also talked about body positions, all the anatomical positions. Remember, we're going to be standing straight up with our palms facing forward and our toes facing forward. That's going to be anatomically neutral. And that's going to be what we use as our standard of reference. Um, we talked about prone versus supine, so prone being on your face, um, supine on your back. We also talked about all of these different regional names, which you will need to know. Um, for the purposes of this exam, and remember it's a cumulative final, so we have a lot of um, we have a lot of chapters to go over. So for the purposes of this exam, I'm aiming for two to three questions each for the 151 material, and then three to four questions each for each of the chapters of the 152 material. So that means you're going to see over 100 questions. We're probably going to see about 50 questions or so from the 151 and about 75 or so from the 152 material. I haven't, I've chosen the questions in the question bank, but I haven't pulled the ones I want to use yet. So I haven't, can't give you exact numbers, but that's approximately what you're going to see is a ratio of about two to three questions per chapter on 151 and three to four questions per chapter on 152. So it's a little heavier. And also because of that, I'm going to be pulling just one of these. So you will need to know all of these regional names, but one of them will be a question, for example. Um, we will also have a question that's a directional term, basically, like where is the knee relative to the hip? And you'll have to tell me which direction things are, whether they're, you know, superior, inferior, anterior, et cetera. All right? Um, we also have planes. There's one question on the planes, um, and it and I will tell you, we'll see no repeating questions. So none of the questions that you've seen before, you will see again. They will be very similar questions, but they will not be identical, which means that everything will be changed. So if you saw um, a section, so for example, if the mid-sagittal plane was tested on the exam, that's not going to be the plane I test you on. It might be a frontal plane or a coronal plane or a transverse plane, right? So you will still see testing on that subject area, but you won't see any of the same questions again. Okay. Um, we also talked about body cavities. When we talked about body cavities, we also talked about where the internal organs were relative to the body cavities. Sorry, I haven't scrolled down from you guys here. Just wanted to know the planes, the body cavities. You'll need to know where most of the most of the relative most of the organs are relative to the abdominal quadrants. Um, I'm going to keep scrolling. In terms of medical imaging, there's not going to be very many questions on medical imaging for the exam, so I don't think you'll have to know that. And now we have moved on to the organization of matter. For those of you following along, I'm on page nine. I might just have you guys follow along on your computers instead of go back and forth, but that's okay. Um, okay, so we're on page nine here. We're entering into the organization of matter. We talk about some of the basic um, units of chemistry that we talk about. Um, how we are basically having our atoms interacting with each other. We need to know that atoms are all units of this particular element, it's the smallest version of an element that still retains the characteristics of the element. Right? If we go any further, we end up with subatomic sub particles, which all atoms are comprised of. Um, you need to know the difference between protons, neutrons, and electrons. Yes, in terms of their positive versus negative versus neutrality. Also in terms of whether or not they carry molecular weight. Right. Um, uh, let's see, also need to know how they interact. So not like very specifically, but you will need to know that a positive ion and a negative ion will interact to make a salt, for example, right? Um, let's see. So you'll need to know the difference between the different types of chemical bonds, absolutely. So you'll need to know the difference between an ionic bond, a covalent bond, hydrogen bonding, yes. Um, we also talked about energy and how there's a difference between potential energy, kinetic energy, and chemical energy. We 
mainly focused on chemical energy because we're talking about these biomolecules and how they interact. Specifically, when we got to metabolism in 152, we talked about this. Um, you will need to know about enzymes, that enzymes speed up the rate of chemical reactions. You'll need to know that certain reactions are going to release energy and other reactions are going to require energy input, i.e. exergonic versus endergonic. Let's see. Um, uh, the difference between a catabolic and an anabolic reaction, so the difference between a reaction that is taking a large molecule and breaking it down into smaller molecules, these are usually exergonic, and one that's taking two smaller molecules and putting them together to make a larger molecule, right? Um, that's going to be anabolic, and these are usually going to be um, endergonic. Energy usually has to go in. We talked about redox reactions um, and how we were able to have electrons transfer from one to the other. And remember, Leo the lion goes ger, so loss of electrons, oxidation, gain of electrons, reduction. Uh, we also talked about the different types of compounds and solutions, water being the most important compound in your body, also water being an inorganic molecule, so the difference between organic and inorganic being what it's comprised of. In order to be organic, it's going to have to have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, water, which does not have carbon, is considered an inorganic compound. But water is going to be utilized all the time because it's got partial charges, partial positive, partial negative charges, so it's got some polarity to it. And it's going to act as the universal solvent. Because of that polarity, it's able to dissociate ions into it, so salts are going to immediately dissociate into their ions. Um, and anything that's going to form bonds with water is typically going to be considered hydrophilic, right? It's going to usually be polar covalent bonding as opposed to nonpolar. Nonpolar is going to be hydrophobic. Again, think oil and water. And this is going to be the really primary component when we get to plasma membranes because of the fact that that water and oil interaction, that hydrophobic interaction that's going to be in the center of the membrane is going to provide isolating function from the inside and the outside of the cell. We talked about water being really important in chemical reactions because it's able to be broken down and help cap off the sticky ends when the molecules are going to have some, um, some reactions. So therefore, we're able to utilize that to take large molecules and break them down, also splitting water in half and using 1OH group and 1H group to make the ends of both molecules happy. Also using those same idea, when we're putting two molecules together via dehydration synthesis, we're going to pull off an OH group, pull off a hydrogen group, and join those two molecules back together. Um, which is going to make a water molecule, so that's why it's called dehydration synthesis, because water comes out at that point. Um, water also has a really high ability to absorb heat, which means that it's able to help us maintain our temperature very well. We also utilize it um, as it's the ability for evaporation to help us keep cool, and we use it as a lubricant in all of our mucus and mucus membranes, et cetera. So anytime that we have organs that are rubbing across each other that are going to have friction, we're also typically going to have water as the lubricant, so that be able to help reduce that friction. Um, just following along, I'm on page 16. Okay. Um, we talked about mixtures, different types of mixtures. So things that go into water can either be um, a solution, a suspension, or um, a colloid, basically, we're able to have a solution where things are going to actually dissolve inside of it. At this point, we're probably dealing with more solvent than solution, and we're also dealing with something that will actually become soluble, as opposed to something like sand or sediment, which feels like it might spin up into solution, but will eventually settle out, which is C there, the suspension. Eventually, it'll settle out. It's not actually going into the water. When we have a solution, we can describe it in two different ways, via percentage and via molarity. Percent is going to tell you how much of it is found in a given volume, and the molarity is going to be, uh, moles are like 6.022 times 10 to the negative 22nd, right? Um, so it's a specific amount of that molecule, and a specific amount of the molecule is going to have a different molecular weight than a different molecule of that exact same specified amount. So we utilize molecular weight sometimes to be able to talk about things like molarity. So if we know that one mole of a substance equals X amount of grams, if we put that amount of grams into a liter, that's going to be one mole of solution. Um, we talked about acids and bases. We talked about it cursory in 151, but then we talked about it pretty extensively as we talked about buffers and metabolism. So although in 151 this kind of felt intense and overwhelming, you should be very familiar by now of the way that acids and bases work and the fact that we're going to basically be having a comparison of the concentration of hydrogen versus the concentration of OH in all of our bodily fluids and that we want to maintain a really nice concentration, a relative concentration of these two. And so we do a couple tricky things where we're going to hide extra hydrogen or hide extra OH. That's how buffers 
hours work. We also are going to have that be relative to the amount of carbon dioxide that we're bringing into our body, because remember that can get converted into carbonic acid, which is slightly acidic. Um, so this is all very, very relative, specifically when we get later on in 152, when we talk about fluid and fluid balance. So although this seemed kind of overwhelming when we were discussing it in 151, at this point, this should be a complete no-brainer to you. Um, pH of 7 is going to be neutral, pH above 7 is going to be um, alkaline, pH below 7 is going to be acidic, and remember that it is going to be a logarithmic scale, so every time that you up or down one level, you're actually going an increase of tenfold, not just doubling, right? Um, then the pH system is really has to be very well maintained because if our pH gets out of whack, then we end up unable to perform our metabolic reactions. Remember, enzymes have to work at a specific pH, so we do a really nice job of maintaining via homeostasis, our pH levels using all sorts of buffer systems. And again, we talked about in 152 when we talked about um, all of the fluid balance. Okay, so when we talk about biomolecules, we have to recognize that carbon is the central structure. I'm on page 17 now. Uh, and the carbon is able to make versatile structures because of the fact that it's able to form four separate bonds. And it can utilize those four bonds in different ways. So it can make four single bonds, it can make two double bonds, one triple and one single, or whatever. So lots of different options in how it's able to utilize the bondings. And that means that it's able to interact with its other atoms around it to make things like rings and helices and all of these different shapes. And also, keep in mind that we just said that ions are going to dissolve immediately in water. And since we have an aqueous solution inside our body, ionic bonds are not going to be what we want to utilize for things like biomolecules. So we're going to be using covalent bonds for all of that. Um, and so all of the carbon compounds are going to be held together by covalent bonds, including our rings like sugars, right? We also utilize it in the DNA background, backbone, et cetera. And there's a ton of functional groups that we went over. You don't need to memorize the functional groups for the final, but we did quiz you on them in 151, and you will need to know them particularly if you go into OCHEM or when you get into pathopharmacology or whatnot, so I would recommend that you brush up on those but not study for this exam. We do need to know the four major biomolecules, right? The first one of those is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates is going to include sugars, starches, ah, glycogen, and cellulose. Remember, cellulose is something we are unable to digest. Termites are, though, fun fact. Right? And so cellulose is what's going to hold like our large plants together, things like our tree trunks, etc. And these carbohydrates can be either simple sugars, which are going to be our monomers, or complex sugars, complex carbohydrates, which in this case are going to be polymers or large chains. So keep in mind that all four of our biomolecule sets come in monomeric and dimeric and polymeric forms, right? So they all come in single Legos and large Lego complexes, right? And remember, you can put the Legos together in different ways. So we can put our sugars together to make different types of sugars, et cetera. Um, so these are basically like train cars that can get put together into long trains, and each of the different four biomolecules is comprised of a different train car. The second set that we looked at were lipids. Lipids are also going to be carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they have a different ratio. Remember when we talked about carbohydrates, it was a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, right? Um, so it's always going to be C6H12O6, for example. Examples of lipids are going to be things like fatty acids, um, triglycerides, waxes, steroids, phospholipids, which we talked about extensively when we talked about the phospholipid membrane, its isolating function, all of the things that were embedded in it, things like receptors and glycoproteins. So the phospholipids form the basic structure of the membrane, which isolates the inside of the cell from the outside. So without phospholipid function, there would be no metabolism, there would be no gas exchange, there would be nothing, right? Um, proteins are the other, the next class that we talked about. Proteins are going to include things like enzymes. Um, which are biological catalysts. We also use them, we use them for all sorts of things. They perform all of the functions inside the cell. Yeah, we don't need that anymore, right? Um, we're on slide 21 now. Um, the fourth class is gonna be nucleic acids. That's gonna include DNA and RNA. Again, these are organic molecules because they have hydrogen, carbon, and um, oxygen. They're also gonna have nitrogen and phosphorus inside of them. And the monomers of nucleic acids are nucleotides. And we can use some of the nucleotides that we would normally put into DNA as energy carrier molecules like ATP if we add an extra phosphate on there. So remember the backbone of DNA is going to be sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate with the base pairs in the center. If we add a second phosphate, we go from AMP, adenosine monophosphate, to ADP. And ADP doesn't get put into the DNA chain. It gets utilized as the low energy version of an energy carrier molecule. And if we add a third phosphate, we get ATP. So 
Adenosine can be utilized either in the growing chain or as a carrier molecule. So can guanine, right? A, T, C, and G are our four um, nucleotides. And guanine can also be used as a carrier molecule for a short period of time. Remember, we talked about the Krebs cycle. We talked about GTP holding the phosphate for just a second to give it back to ATP. But when we only have one phosphate, it's usually going to be utilized to go into the developing um, DNA molecule. Okay, so that brings us to lecture three. Um, lecture three is cellular organization. We talked about the cell. We talked about all the different parts of the cell, including all the organelles. Yes, you do have to know every organelle. As I mentioned, we're probably only going to ask you about one or two of them, but since you don't know which one that is, you're going to need to know all of them. Um, the main parts of the cell are going to include the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, the nucleus, and then the organelles that are found inside there as well, like the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, etc. Plasma membrane is separated by a lipid bilayer comprised mainly of phospholipids. Remember, lipids are amphipathic, meaning one side is hydrophobic, one side is hydrophilic, and so that's going to allow them to orient with those two hydrophobic tails towards the center, two hydrophilic heads on the outside, so we essentially have water with a layer of oil and then another set of water or aqueous solution separating out the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. But it's not just lipids that are going to make this plasma membrane. The plasma membrane has a ton of proteins inside there as well, including integral proteins, which go all the way through, and peripheral proteins, which are just going to be on the outside. Integral proteins are typically going to be amphipathic because they have to have an area that interacts with water and an area that interacts with oil, right? The area that goes through the membrane. So they're going to have typically have areas that stretch across the layer that are going to be water, uh, sorry, water fearing, right? Hydrophobic, and areas that are on the inside and outside of the cell that are going to be hydrophilic. Membrane proteins have a ton of functions. We have channels and carriers that are going to allow things in and out of the cell at the cell's will. Remember, the cell is, is Plasma membrane is what we call semi-permeable. That means it gets to selectively choose what goes in and what goes out based on what it needs and based on how much it has inside and outside. Um, we also have receptors, which are going to allow us to take information from the external environment, things like epinephrine or hormones that might need to make changes inside the cell. We have, again, enzymes, which provide biological reactions, linker proteins that hold the cells together so that our cells don't just slough off. If we grab the outside of our skin, it's not going to rip off of our hands because of these linker proteins that hold the cells together that are called junctional molecules. And we also have cell identity markers that say, hey, I'm Dr. Griffiths' heart cell, right? So we have a lot of specialty proteins that are embedded inside the membrane. Membranes are very fluid. Remember we talked about like a series of balloons on the ceiling and how if you were to grab the string from one balloon and slowly bring it across, you could move it while keeping it in the layer of balloons. So although it looks like it's a nice layer, it is a nice thin layer, but each of the molecules are able to freely move, which means they can aggregate, they can move apart. So it's going to be a, um, it's a fluid mosaic model is what they utilize to say there. Uh, some things come through, other things don't are not allowed through. So it really depends on what the cell wants in or wants out. We can export things. We're also constantly trading. We're saying, hey, I'm going to send out um, sodium and bring in potassium, for example. So oftentimes when we're sending one thing one direction, we're pulling something the other direction. Remember, we're typically going to try to go with the concentration gradient. We're always going to have a difference in the concentration of whatever the molecule is on the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. And if we're going along the concentration gradient, like going from high to low, this is not going to cost us any cellular energy to bring this molecule in. But if we have to pump this molecule out because we have too much of it and we want to get rid of it, that is going to cost us cellular energy. So transport across the plasma membrane is going to either cost us money or not. And when I say money, I obviously mean ATP or NADH or FADH or some sort of cell carrier uh, currency. So the transport processes are either going to be active or passive. If we are active, it's going to cost us energy. If it is passive, it is not going to do so. Um, passive processes are pretty much always going with the concentration gradient. Things like simple diffusion, where we're going from high to low directly across the membrane. Facilitated diffusion, high to low, but we need a carrier of some sort, either a carrier or channel protein. Osmosis, again, high to low typically, but we're doing it because we're going from the concentration of water. So osmosis either goes directly through the membrane or through aquaporin channels that are specific for water. So no, you can't learn chemistry by sleeping on your textbook and having it get into your brain by osmosis. Um, let's see. So again, passive processes again include diffusion, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion. You do need to know the difference between the two. I think there is one question on a specific type of channel-mediated diffusion. I know there's a question on the sodium-potassium pump because I think that's very important, and we talked about it extensively. We talked about fluid balance, so you should know that. Um, and also the difference between 
transport of water, which is osmosis, versus the transport of other biomolecules, specifically referring to tonicity. Remember, so isotonic, a solution is going to be the same concentration on the inside and the outside. And then we also have hypertonicity and hypo, hyper and hypotonicity. And I want to be very clear here that when we have the solution being hypertonic, the cell is hypotonic and vice versa. So this is like saying better than or less than. You can't have a better than without having a less than. So you have to carefully read your question because it could say that the solution is hypotonic to the cell or it could say the cell is hypotonic to the solution. So you need to know greater than, less than here. Hypotonic is less than, hypertonic is more than, right? Hyper kids act up on sugar, hypo is gonna be lower. And remember I told you that the way to remember this, if a cell is in a hypotonic solution, it's going to swell up like a hippo and eventually lice called hemolysis. If it's in a hypertonic solution, it purges its water, right? So it's going to shrivel. We want to keep it isotonic. And I know for sure that when I wrote this exam, I threw in a fourth answer because I don't like having ABC, so I threw in a D of gin and tonic, which is not a real thing, right? That's a drink, so. Uh, but don't choose that one because every year somebody does. All right, <laughs> um, active processes is when we're utilizing energy. We have to have a carrier protein or a channel protein that's moving something from one side to the other. Most prevalent primary active transport is the sodium potassium pump. We're going to utilize this. That's our question on this. We're constantly going to be pulling in potassium because we never quite seem to have enough and there's not a lot on the outside either. And we're always pumping out sodium because we always have too much and there's pretty much always a lot on the outside too. And this costs us energy. So that's why it says there's a, a sodium potassium ATPase. Um, it's going to cost us energy. This is an example of active transports. Um, we also have the ability to bring large molecules in. We're going to do this by endocytosis. The entire membrane is going to reach out and wrap around. So we have little pseudopods that come out and wrap around whatever it is we're trying to engulf. We're going to invaginate it, pull it inside, and digest it, right? So phagocytosis is when we're ingesting solid particles. Once we bring it in, then we're going to start figuring out if we're able to use it. So that's basically cell eating. We also have cell sipping called penocytosis. Penocytosis is the ingestion of small bits of extracellular fluid. So we're constantly having an exchange of the fluid inside the cell and outside of the cell. Um, and again, that's called, it's also called bulk phase endocytosis, but for our purposes, it's called penocytosis. Um, if things are being brought in, it's called endocytosis. If they're exiting, it's called exocytosis. And sometimes things are being brought in just for the purposes of being brought through. So say we didn't have doors in this room and we need to get to a room on the other side. It might come through this wall and then go through that wall but not actually be part of our room at all just for a small moment. That's called transcytosis when something's coming in via endocytosis but exiting almost immediately via exocytosis because it has to go a couple of skin layers or cell layers through. All right, again, we have three major types of fluids. We have the extracellular fluid, we have the blood plasma, we have the cytosol. We have other fluids too. We have lymphatic fluids, cerebral spinal fluid, yada, yada. But for the purposes of exchange, we're going to have the exchange from the blood plasma to the interstitial fluid to the cytosol. The cytosol is the intracellular fluid inside the cytoplasm. It's going to have all sorts of dissolved solutes in there. This is going to be the site of metabolism. We've got organelles as well. Everybody's kind of doing their own function. This is basically like what is surrounding the city, and the city is all of these different organelles. The chemicals are basically going to be either, um, they're typically going to be in solution, so they're typically going to be like already um, in, uh, already solubilized in the liquid medium. And again, the cytosol is the liquid portion and the cytoplasm is the liquid portion but also includes the organelles. So the cytoplasm includes cytosol and organelles. We also have the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is our structural framework. Things like microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. These do things like cellular scaffolding, cellular motion. They also involved in um, centrioles and the flagella, which motion of the sperm, for example, or cilia, which motion the, the cells in the trachea, or the uterus, for example, which move fluid across them. Microtubules are going to be involved in those, the um, cilia and flagella. We also use these for the centrosomes, which is going to be an area where we're going to have um, centrioles. Centrioles are going to be where we have microtubules organized to help the spindle fibers during cellular division. So these aren't going to be around all the time, but when we're about to enter into meiosis, they go to opposite sides and they start sending out spindle fibers to help connect at the center of the, um, during the metaphase spread at the center of what's called the kinetochore region and the centromere of each of these dividing chromosomes. Um, so yeah, know the difference between cilia and flagella. Cilia, there's many of them, and the cell stays put, liquid goes across it, like the trachea or the uterus. Um, in flagella, it's only one of them, and it's an extension on the back of the cell, and the cell swims through the liquid media, as opposed to cilia, we're pushing media across the cell. Um, 
Ribosomes are where we're going to produce protein synthesis. We took a whole discussion on that. We basically take DNA, we make mRNA from it. That mRNA leaves the nucleus through nuclear pores, finds ribosomes, and then we're going to look at three sets of what we call a, um, it's a codon, right? So we're going to take a look at those and have a, a tRNA come in, figure out whether or not it pairs. When it does have an anticodon that does pair, it's going to add one amino acid for every three of our, um, well, it's a codon, right? So we have three of our nucleotides. But again, that happens on the ribosomes, and that's a chapter going forward. Endoplasmic reticulum is how um, we're going to, basically we have two regions. We have the rough ER and the smooth ER. The rough ER is going to be studded with ribosomes. We just talked about ribosomes being the site of protein synthesis. Um, incidentally, ribosomes are made in the nucleus in a region called the nucleolus, um, which is in the very center of the nucleus. So ribosomes are going to be the area where we're creating proteins, and they're attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, but we also have some free in suspension. And the other part of the endoplasmic reticulum is going to be the site of lipid synthesis, where we are not going to have any uh, ribosomes on it, so we call it the smooth ER, because when we looked under the microscope, that's what we saw. The ER is going to be involved in the transport of substances from one set to the other. It's basically going to have a vesicular transport system, so you might picture that it'll bleb off of the membrane of one organelle and then find its way attaching to and then adhering to the next organelle. So it's involved in the, um, in the intermembrane system. It's also involved in the detoxification of chemicals, the synthesis of molecules, and it's going to also be involved in the calcium ions which are released during muscle contraction, which we talked about when we talked about muscles. And what does the Golgi do? The Golgi is going to sort the proteins that were created by the ER. So once they're created by the ribosomes, they then get shuffled over the Golgi apparatus, and it's a series of stacked membranes known as cisterns. And every level, we get another tag on it that gets more specific. Basically, we're saying, are we going east, west, north, south? What state, what city, what neighborhood, what address? And eventually, we get a little tag, and all of the proteins going to that particular location are going to get into a vesicle and get transported, whether it's outside of the cell or over to it, the lysosome or to the membrane, et cetera. So that's what the Golgi complex does is sorts out the proteins. Lysosomes and peroxisomes and proteasomes are, are cellular trash can recycling, et cetera. So the lysosomes are going to be um, a digestive mechanism for anything that is going to be worn out organelles or if we have to destroy the whole cell, right, the process of apoptosis or autolysis. Um, peroxisomes are similar, but they have oxidases in them. So they are able to use hydrogen peroxide to break down anything that is inside here. So typically we're going to send toxins over here or anything that is kind of nasty that we want to really break down before we get rid of it. We also have proteasomes. Proteasomes break down proteins. So this is like having the recycling for just the aluminum cans. This is only for proteins. Basically it breaks the proteins back down into their amino acids, sends the amino acids back out into solution, which get picked up by tRNA and then get brought back over to a ribosome and then get added to whatever developing protein chain. So it's a recycling for the amino acids in the proteasomes. We talked extensively about mitochondria when we talked about the um, Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. The mitochondria is going to be the region where we make ATP inside the cell. Um, we also said that mitochondria are kind of their own little organism. They have their own DNA. They self-replicate. And also keep in mind when we talked about reproduction, the sperm head is all that makes it into the egg, not the tail. The mitochondria are found in the sperm tail. So the mitochondrial DNA is only going to be inherited from mom. Okay, the nucleus is basically going to be the office, the, um, the boss's office of the cell. It's going to be the most prominent feature unless we are going to be undergoing cell division during mitosis, we're not gonna see the nucleus, right? Because we're gonna have all this chromosome condensed down. But typically, the chromosomes are gonna be unwound into what we call chromatin and housed in the nucleus. And this is going to be where we're going to have the interaction of DNA with RNA to be able to make the, oh, well, DNA makes RNA and the RNA leaves to be able to make proteins. This is essentially how we're going to control the protein synthesis. I'm on page 31. Um, protein synthesis has three major steps. It's going to start off with transcription, and then we have translation, and then that last step is going to be termination. Um, <clears throat> so transcription is going to be the very first step when we're going to have um, DNA that starts off as, well, information starts off as a DNA molecule. Then we have the RNA binding to the DNA and making it elongating RNA transcript. Eventually that's going to hit a termination sequence, a stop region, and it's going to fall off. And then it's going to go to the nuclear pores and it's going to say, may I leave? Remember the nuclear pores have a couple of questions they're going to ask before they let that RNA transcript out. They're going to ask, what sugar are you? Are you using um, basically deoxyribose or using ribose? 
If you're using ribose, that's a good answer for question number one. Second is, are you um, single-stranded or double-stranded? Remember, DNA is double-stranded and will not be allowed to leave. RNA is single-stranded and will be allowed to leave. And third, we're asking, are you using uracil or thymine, right, U or T? If you answer all three of those questions, questions correctly, you're utilizing thymine, you're single-stranded, and you're using ribose, you will be allowed to leave through the nuclear pores and then find a ribosome in order to do the next set, which is translation. Translation is when we take that mRNA molecule and we're going to turn it into a protein by having transfer RNAs come over one at a time. Remember that mRNA has a codon sequence, the transfer RNAs have an anti-codon sequence that multiple are going to try. Basically, we throw it until something sticks. Once something sticks, it's going to be allowed to have its amino acid added to the developing pep polypeptide chain and we will do this again until we hit a stop codon and then once we do then we'll, this whole thing will fall apart and then newly synthesized protein will go into solution the RNA will be utilized over and over until it degrades so again two major steps the first is transcription whereby um, DNA is making RNA we're going to have initiation, elongation, and termination for transcription. And then for translation, same thing, initiation, elongation, and termination, where we're creating a protein. Keep in mind that this happens, that transcription happens in the nucleus, and translation happens in the cytoplasm. That's a major difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, it all happens in the same spot, but in eukaryotes, it's separated. Um, Okay, so cell division is a special time when we're going to be making sure that our DNA is appropriate for a division. We're going to be replicating our DNA, and then we're going to start transferring that DNA into two separate nuclei. So how do we do that? Well, the cell spends most of its time in interphase. Interphase is going to be G1, S, and G2. G1 is when we're basically cells stay in G1 until they're told to enter S. In the S phase, if they're selected to move from G1 into S, they're going to synthesize their DNA. S stands for synthesis. I'm on page 34 now. Um, and the synthesis of the DNA is going to make sure that we have faithfully replicated every single chromosome. And then we're going to enter into the G2 phase. After the G2 phase, we're going to continue to grow, and we're going to prep for cell division. And then we're going to enter into a stop point where we say, is the DNA faithfully replicated? Can you move on? And if so, then we're going to enter into mitosis. So if all of the parameters have been met, the DNA has been faithfully replicated, and we're able to utilize this cell to split into two, the first thing that has to happen is prophase. Prophase is when we are going to have the chromatin condensing down into chromosomes. The nuclear envelope is going to break apart. Um, and then we're going to enter into metaphase. It's kind of a continuous slide. So there's like a pro-metaphase, too, where you're like working into metaphase. During metaphase, all the chromosomes are going to line up at what we call the metaphase spread, so basically in the equator of the cell. And at this point, we're going to have the attachment from the spindle fibers to the centromeres and we're going to go through and do a quick check to make sure everything is lined up properly because what was an X is about to become two little eyes pulled to opposite sides that happens during anaphase when the centromeres are split the two sister chromatids move to opposite poles and then telophase is going to take over where we're going to have the nuclear envelope reforming cytokinesis is going to split the two cells into two meaning that we're going to have one nucleus in each of two new cells and approximately the same or half amount of the cytoplasm all right. So cytokinesis happens right after telophase. It's akin to like walking out the door and having the door shut. They always happen in concert almost at the same time, but there is a sequence to them, right? Um, basically what happens during cytokinesis is we're going to take what's an oval and we're going to start tightening the belts until it eventually becomes two small O's with one nucleus in each. So all cells have three choices. And again, they don't really get given the choice, but there are three options for cell fate. They're either to stay in what we call cellular senescence, which basically means you're alive and functioning, but you're not dividing anymore. We're never going to call on you to make a new cell. Or we can in tap you to be the cell that is going to divide, so we're going to ask you to undergo mitosis. Or we can end up at cellular death, right? Um, and we regulate all of these stages um, of DNA replication via what's called cyclin-dependent kinases. Remember when I talked about it being a complete cycle of, of interphase and then mitosis, and I guess we go interphase and then mitosis, right? Um, and so we want to make sure that everything goes properly and we're only going forward, right? We're never going to replicate our DNA and then not divide. And so these cycling dependent kinases are basically making sure that we get from step A to step B, from B to C, et cetera, in a cyclical fashion. We also talked about the difference between apoptosis and necrosis. Remember, apoptosis is programmed cell death, where the cell is chosen to divide, I'm uh, sorry, it's chosen to die off, apologies, and all of the cells next to it will be able to harvest its pieces. This is akin to saying, hey, I'm going to be leaving and I'm never coming back to this house and telling your neighbors, if you'd like my windows and my roof and my flooring to build your houses, you can do that. 
Whereas necrosis is walking away and not telling your neighbors about your house and letting the jungle come back and take over. This is kind of having like an amputated finger or something like this, which is just going to basically rot and not be utilized by the cells around it. So necrosis is a pathological cell death due to injury. Might see it in things like frostbite, et cetera. Um, see it in the uh, diabetes, for example, when we are getting proper circulation to the regions of the tissue. Um, okay, so that was mitosis. We just talked about regular cell division, but we also have meiosis, which is reproductive cell division when we are making haploid gametes from our diploid somatic cells. This happens in particular organs, the testes and the ovaries, where we are making sperm and eggs. Um, they're both going to go through the process of meiosis one and meiosis two. Basically, we're gonna have one cellular reproduction event where we double our DNA and two division events. So if we double and then divide twice, we end up with half of what we started with. And so we're actually gonna be undergoing meiosis one and meiosis two, and each of these are going to have prophase, so there's prophase one, pro and metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, then prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two, right? So at the end, we're gonna end up with haploid cells, four haploid cells that again are genetically unique from each other, whereas mitosis is going to create cells that are genetically identical to each other. The major difference between meiosis and mitosis is something called crossing over. Um, which is three at meiosis one. It's gonna happen in prophase of meiosis one and essentially what happens is we're shifting information from the maternal homologue to the paternal homologue prior to dividing into our ova or our sperm. So we are shuffling the genes from our parents prior to creating the offspring. Um, okay, lots of different types of cells. We've talked about a lot of different types of cells throughout the semester, so I don't have to tell you that cells look different and perform different functions within the body, right? Um, Let's see, homeostatic imbalances. We do talk about these, but I wouldn't focus on these for the exams. Again, we're only gonna be pulling two to three questions from each of these chapters. So we're gonna be focusing on the major ideas, right? Um, okay, so we're now on slide 38. We're talking about tissue organization. Tissues are gonna be when we have cells that are organized into particular patterns that are going to allow the tissue to have a particular function. Also, we're typically going to get some sort of specialization of the tissue that allows it to perform that particular function. And if we're looking at tissues underneath the microscope, we're going to call that histology. And if we're looking at abnormal tissue under a microscope, we're going to call that pathology, looking at the laboratory samples of things that have issues. And if we have problems with our we might call that a pathological disorder because it has something that is going to be completely different from the normal morphology. And there's a ton of different types of pathological disorders. Um, all right, so we have multiple different types of tissue. Know the difference of different types of epithelial tissue, including connective tissue, different types of connective tissue. This is every like, reticular tissue, et cetera, everything that's gonna be holding the layers together. We also have muscle tissue, so you'll need to know the different types of muscle tissue, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth and the differences between the two, which ones have striations, how do they function, are they autonomic, um, or are they somatic, like are we in charge of them or not, et cetera. Um, and we also have nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is gonna be electrically excitable and transmit electrical impulses or action potentials that are gonna help it coordinate our body's activities by allowing muscles or innervation into glands for secretion to the endocrine system, et cetera. All right, multiple different types of cell junctions. Cell junctions are how we're holding our cells together. We have tight junctions, which are fluid, um, tight seals. So these are gonna be like your Ziploc bags. They're more like a vacuum seal. They're basically gonna make sure that we're unable to have liquid go from one side to the other. Um, and we also have adherence junctions. Adherence junctions are basically like little plaques that are held together, like little, um, if, if tight junctions are vacuum seals and adhered junctions are like zippers, I guess. We also have desmosomes, which are more like snaps, and hemidesmosomes would only be half of that, but that would be like one drop of hot glue holding them together, not like a long line, just in particular locations. Gap junctions are cool because they allow us to communicate from one to the other. Remember the tin can telephone that I was talking about to you and your neighbor, or like throwing up the window in the third floor of one building and being able to communicate with the person on the third floor of the next building without leaving the building and coming back up. So it allows cells to coordinate responses pretty quickly together, especially if we need to like sound an alarm or all coordinate uh, electrical impulse for, um, for contraction of a muscle or something like that. All right, so what's the difference between epithelial and connective tissue? Um, well, 
number one, how many cells there are versus the extracellular matrix, right? I talked to this, I said, though, look, this is a city and this is a farm. Look at the amount of nuclei versus the amount of extracellular matrix. Connected tissue is going to have a lot of extracellular matrix. That's the farm. Epithelial tissue has a lot of cells tightly packed on top of each other in a nice structured order, more like the city. Um, Let's see. Oh, also vasculature. So epithelial tissue does not have blood vessels, but most connective tissue does have blood vessels. So vasculature is going to be found in connective tissue, not epithelial tissue. We talked about the different features of epithelial tissue. They're typically arranged in these multiple or single layers of sheets. So we talked about whether it was going to be simple, right? Um, simple would be one layer. We also talked about if it was columnar or epithelial, et cetera, um, et cetera. So we wanted to talk about the different ways that we organize the epithelium. Basically, are they going to be in a single layer or in many layers? Are they shaped in a squamous or cuboidal or columnar, right? Is it real columns or is it a pseudo? So it's either going to be classified as stratified or pseudo stratified in terms of the columnar, basically looking as whether or not it is two layers or does it just appear to be two layers, right? So again, we'll be looking at single or stratified or the three different basically squamous or cuboidal or columnar, so the shape as well. We also talked about the different types of cell junctions and how we're holding them together. We just spoke about the different types of them, but they're going to be different in the different epithelial tissues. Um, the epithelial tissue is avascular but has nervous tissue, and it's going to be able to quickly self-renew because it's going to be something that's typically under a lot of stress and will be sloughing off or undergoing damage. Again, we're going to classify our epithelial tissue as simple or stratified. Is it one layer or two? Or we can also have pseudostratified, typically only with columnar, when one layer looks like many but is really only one. Um, this would be like having a two-story building where some, sometimes we have a window on the first story and one window on the second story, but we don't actually have two stories. It's just two stories tall and there's one room inside of it, but it appears to be two stories from the outside because the windows are in different locations, like the nuclei. So either the nuclei are all lined up and it's really obvious that it's on one layer, or they're in different, what looks like different layers, but it's all the same height. Again, that's pseudostratified. Um, and then we just talked about the three shapes, flat, cube-like, or rectangular, and we also have transitional epithelium, where we're going to have one of them converting into the other. So that's going to be a variable epithelial layer, basically found in between two different types of epithelial tissue. Now, epithelial line all sorts of layers inside the cells. So we're going to find that, or inside, sorry, inside the human body, the cells are going to line all of these different lumen, essentially. So we're going to find it lining our vasculature. We're going to find it lining our gastric system. We're going to find it lining our respiratory system, our reproductive system. Anytime we have a mucous membrane, it's probably going to be an epithelial layer, right? Um, again, a simple epithelial layer is going to be one layer. We can also have cuboidal epithelial, which is going to have one layer of cube cells, um, simple columnar epithelial, one layer of columnar cells, etc. And we went over this extensively. I'm pretty sure you did this in the lab as well. So you'll, you should know the different types of epithelial layers. Okay. Um, we also talked about glands. We talked about endocrine glands and exocrine glands. And basically the difference is whether or not we're going to be secreting into the surface or into the internal things like the blood, et cetera. So endocrine glands are going to have no ducts and secrete directly into the extracellular fluid or into the blood supply. And exocrine glands are going to be things like sweat glands or whatnot. They're going to empty the surface of a something or the lumen of a hollow organ, like into the gallbladder, for example, or something like that, right? So um, again, endocrine glands are going to be having no duct and exocrine glands are going to have ducts that empty into a, some location. Okay, we also talked about the different classification of these glands, whether they had um, one cell or many cells. An example of a single cell would be like the goblet cell inside the intestines, just one cell but constantly secreting mucus, for example. Um, or they could have many cells, like multicellular glands, like a sweat gland or an oil gland or a salivary gland or something like that that's going to be a large structure, larger structure that's going to secrete into the hollow lumen and then be able to shoot that out when we need saliva, for example. Um, we also talked about the different ways that exocrine glands are created. We have miracrine, apocrine, and holocrine. Um, miracrine glands are going to basically create vesicles and empty their vesicles out via exocytosis. So they're constantly having the vesicles reach the surface and secrete the fluid and reach the surface and secrete the fluid. We also have apocrine glands where we're going to actually have a vessel pinch off at the surface. So a vesicle is going to leave the cell containing some fluid inside of it and maybe meet with something else, 
for example, like picked up by a sperm cell or by another cell that's able to grab that vesicle. And we also have holocrine glands, whereas the cell itself is going to become the glandular secretion. And um, in this case, the discharge cell is going to die off and become the secretory product and will be replaced by a new cell that's kind of up and coming behind them. So let's also talk about connective tissue. Connective tissue is all of the support tissue. It's usually going to be right underneath the epithelial tissue. It's going to include um, extracellular matrix as well as nervous tissue, blood supply, et cetera. Um, so typically, connective tissue is going to have a nerve supply. The only exception to the nervous tissue is cartilage, which does not have a nervous supply, OK? Um, let's see. Different types of connective tissue. Remember fibroblasts. These guys are our quick and dirty construction guys. These are what make our scars, but they're also going to help us heal. They heal very quickly. They're going to pull two sides together. Um, so they don't do the best construction, but they do the fastest construction. Macrophages, which are involved in our immune system, they're going to be phagocytic. That means they can engulf smaller organisms and digest them. Um, we have plasma cells, also part of our immune system, which are going to start from B cells and are going to be antibody secreting cells. So when we talked about immunity, this became, uh, we did, oh, went over this very extensively, talking about which classes everybody went to, whether they went to bone school or blood school, et cetera. Um, we also have mast cells. This is going to be responsible for creation of histamine. Um, histamine is part of the immune response too. It basically is going to be a little red flag that says, hey, come over here, there's an infection, or I need your, I need your help for the immune cells. Um, we have adipose tissue, which are created by adipocytes. These are fat cells. We have two different types, white fat and brown fat. Br brown fat is thermogenic, which helps us with heat. White fat is going to help us with energy storage. Um, again, these are going to basically be storing extra food molecules or extra calories that we're not burning off. So if we are, have um, an excess of calories, we're going to store them in fat. If we have a deficit of calories, we're going to break that fat down and utilize it to drive our energy needs. And last but not least, we have blood cells. These are the white blood cells here, leukocytes. Um, which are going to also be involved in the immune response, right? All of these white blood cells are basically our soldiers that help us attack foreign bodies. Um, okay, extracellular matrix can include things like hyaluronic acid, chondroitin sulfate, et cetera. This is basically going to be a substance that surrounds the cell that helps hold it. We're going to start losing it as we get older, which is why we get wrinkles. This is why all of the things that you find in your ladies' face creams, like collagen, elastin, um, retinol, all these things are going to be your extracellular matrix molecules. I don't know if those creams necessarily work, but they sure do sell well. So the idea of being able to put that back is something that has kind of been a holy grail of like the fountain of youth. Um, all right, so inside our extracellular matrix, the fibers are going to help provide the support for the tissues, again, structure, et cetera. We have a couple different types, as I mentioned, collagen, elastin, reticular fibers. These are all going to help form the framework that's going to support the cells and, of course, and by extension, the tissues and the organs. Um, connective tissue is going to be different, whether it's embryonic or mature, obviously. So um, embryonic tissue is going to be split up into the uh, mesenchyme which is going to form all of the rest of the connective tissue. So mesenchyme is going to be your, like the origin of the rest of the connective. And we also have mucous connective tissue, which is found in the umbilical cord and is part of the exchange of um, information, oh, sorry, exchange of nutrients. We're not going to be discussing that. We didn't even get to that when we talked about reproduction. So I can just go ahead and delete that. Um, our mature connective tissue is going to have cells that have differentiated from mesenchymal cells. So they all start as mesenchymal cells, but they become different types of tissue. Some subtypes are going to include loose connective tissue, dense, con dense connective tissue, cartilage, bone, and blood. So loose connective tissue is going to include adipose tissue, reticular connective tissue, and areolar tissue. We went over that in lab for sure. Um, you will need to know the difference between the two. Again, I'll probably pick one question from this whole section though, right? Remember, we're only doing three questions total for this whole. Um, for this whole section. Dense connective tissue is going to include, um, we have regular connective tissue and irregular connective tissue, which basically is just how we looked under it. If we looked at it histologically, is it going to appear to be nicely ordered or is it going to be kind of disordered, which would be irregular? Um, and then elastic connective tissue is going to allow us recoil. So it's going to have a little bit of stretch, um, et cetera. So it'll go back to its original shape. Cartilage is also connective tissue. It has great strength because of a lot of collagen fibers and chondroitin sulfate. Um, we will take chondroitin sulfate if we're having joint issues. Why? Because probably what's happening is you're having wear down of your 
cartilage inside your knee or inside your elbows or whatever. Remember, cartilage is what lines the two bones, articulating bones, so they're not going to rub on each other. So when we add chondroitin sulfate, it can find a relief from things like knee pain, etc., because we can help maybe not rebuild the cartilage, but at least stave off further damage because cartilage is created by this chondroitin sulfate, which starts to break down. Um, we have precursors to cartilage that are called chondrocytes. Chondrocytes are found in little holes. Remember, lacuna or holes in the matrix. Um, and cartilage is not going to have any blood vessels or nervous tissue. That means it's going to be difficult for cartilage to sustain injury and repair itself fairly well because it's, it's strong, but it's not meant to break, and it really doesn't have the ability to repair the way, say, bone does. Bone's going to have a lot of blood vessels and, and um, nervous tissue, for example. Um, cartilage is going to be accomplished. So growth cartilage happens from the growth from within as opposed to growth from the surface. Three major types of cartilage. Yes, you need to know the difference between hyaline, fibrocartilage, and elastic cartilage. And then remember, bone is going to come from ossified cartilage, so it's osseous tissue. Basically what happens is bone is going to start off as cartilage and we're going to be pulling in calcium and other minerals to ossify this into what we call bone. Bone, we have two major types, compact bone and spongy bone. Remember, compact bone is going to be dense and spongy is going to have a lot of holes in it, right, trabeculae. And inside the compact bone, we're going to have vasculature and nervous tissue. The basic unit is called the osteon, right? The osteon looks like one tree trunk. And we're going to have concentric rings of matrix around the osteon. Inside the very center of the osteon, we're typically going to have vasculature and nervous tissue. And we're going to connect through different types of canals, like Haversian canals, et cetera. Remember, blood is a liquid connective tissue, although we get an entire chapter dedicated to blood alone. But blood is going to have plasma and other formed elements in it that is going to help deliver nutrients, pick up cellular waste, as well as be part of the immune system, always on the lookout for foreign invaders. Anything that's going to be secreted from the blood supply but not picked back up by the blood supply, remember we lose more than we gain when we talk about arterial loss and venous return, and so that extra, which would become edema if we didn't pick it, pick it up from somewhere, is going to be picked up by the lymphatic tissue, right? So lymph fluid is going to be picked up by what gets pushed out of the blood, and it goes through specialty things like lymph nodes, so when we talk about the immune system, we'll talk about that, but it helps us clean that fluid before it goes back into the blood supply. Okay, so what is a membrane? A membrane is a sheet usually of epithelial cells. Typically we have an epithelial layer and then a basal layer that's connective tissue, so we have two different layers of cells on top of each other. This is gonna include things like mucous membranes, serous membranes, skin, or cutaneous membrane. It's also gonna include synovial membranes, which are going to line your connective tissue. So when we're talking about our joints, we talked about synovial membranes. Remember, synovial membranes secrete synovial fluid, and synovial fluid forms a buffer in between like two bones, like the joints of our fingers, for example. Um, so again, mucous membranes are going to be anywhere that we're going to be secreting mucus, typically to anything that opens to the external environment, such as the reproductive organs or the gastrointestinal tract. The epithelial layer is going to be a really important role in body's defense. So in the immunology, basically, it's the first barrier to pathogens, and the mucus is going to be thick and able to trap foreign particles that are trying to enter into the body. Okay, um, different types of membranes include serous membranes and cutaneous membranes. Serous membranes are going to be serosa membranes that are going to lie the inside of the body cavities, anything that doesn't open directly to the external surface. It's also going to cover the organs that lie within the cavity, things like pleura, pericardium, etc., which are things that surround the lungs and the heart. We also have the cutaneous membrane, which is going to be the skin, and the skin is going to be split up into two regions, the dermis and the epidermis. The epidermis is the outer layer that's going to have um, layers of keratinocytes that are making a squamous epithelial layer that constantly creates more and more to shed off. And the dermis is going to be loose and uh, loose connective tissue um, and, sorry, dense connective tissues and areolar connective tissues. Okay. Um, again, we also have synovial membranes. They line the inside of the joint cavities. They are, don't typically have an epithelial layer, but they secrete synovial fluid, which helps perform a buffer in between the two articulating bones. Okay, moving on to nervous, uh, sorry, muscle tissue. So I'm on page 48 here of 155, 145. Um, so muscle tissue is going to be split up into skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. You will need to know the difference. We talked about this in class. 
The difference is that we're going to have our either striations or non-striations. We're going to be under either voluntary or involuntary control. So know which is which. Skeletal muscle obviously is going to be under voluntary control. So we're able to choose our skeletal muscle unless we have a disorder of some sort. Basically what happens is we have the muscle attached to the bones. And when the muscles, which is innervated, fires, it's going to cause contraction. That's going to cause voluntary motion of the bones. We also have cardiac muscle and smooth muscle, neither one of which are going to be attached to bones. Right? These are going to, so the cardiac muscle is going to form the heart wall, and it's under involuntary contraction, like that love-dub, love-dub. You can't really change your heartbeat. That's not true. I could. I could scare you and change it, or I could give you a shot of epinephrine and change it, but other than those major items that you're not actually completely in control of your heart rate. Although, I mean, athletes are able to get a very low resting heart rate. Um, the smooth muscle fibers that are found in other internal organs like your bladder, et cetera, your um, uterus, these are going to be under involuntary control and these are non-striated. So again, you're going to want to know a couple of things. Do, is it voluntary, involuntary? Is it striated or non-striated, et cetera, okay? Um, and there will be one question on one of those three. I can't, I don't know exactly which one, but the difference between those three is something you have to know. Um, all right, nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is basically when we have neurons and neural glia and they're sending information, well, the neurons are sending information to either another neuron in a pathway or an effector of some sort, be it a muscle or a gland or something like that. Neurons are extremely long. They have a cell body that looks like a normal nucleus, but then they're also going to have um, these long regions that protrude out called axons that deliver signals downstream and dendrites that go up to pick up signals from upstream. All right, um, so here's some other types of, remember that neurons are electrically excitable cells, so they're going to basically take a signal, an electrical signal, and pass that on, so it's called an action potential, and we're going to send that on to an effector, be it a gland, another neuron, or a muscle cell. Um, okay. Oh, I didn't talk about the neuroglial cells. So the neurons are going to be the ones that are actually passing the electrical signals on, but the neuroglia are the ones that are taking care of the princesses. Remember, the princess only does one thing. And then we also have a cook, and we have a handmaid, and we have a, a, all of these other people that are going to cater to the princess. It's the same thing. These guys only send electrical impulses. They don't cater to any of the rest of their needs. So we have electrically insulating cells, like Schwann cells that wrap around them, or oligodendrocytes, depending on the central peripheral nervous system. We have cells that, like, that are basically taking care of all all their needs, like astrocytes, etc. So neuroglial cells are going to be cells that are protecting and supporting the neurons. And also, if we see a nervous system tumor, it's almost always a glioblastoma, a glial cell line, because neurons don't reproduce very quickly or very often at all, whereas neuroglial cells do need to reproduce. And so if we see brain tumors, they're almost always from the glial cell line. They're very infrequently neuronal. Um, Okay, so how do we damage tissues that have been in, uh, injured? So that's basically going to be a way that we're going to restore back to homeostasis. And we can do that basically by division of cells that are precursors to whatever cell line we need. Those are going to be called stem cells. Stem cells can be either totipotent or pluripotent. Toti meaning they have all the potential, like embryonic stem cells. Pluri meaning they have many potentials, but I can only become a, a muscle cell line. I can become one of a couple muscle cells, but I, I can't become you know, nervous tissue or whatnot. So pluripotent cells have partial specialization, but they can become almost anything in that field. Either way, these are stem cells that are able to differentiate and take over the role of a damaged or aging cell that needs repair. Some tissues have better capacity for renewal than others. I'm on slide, or page 49 here. Um, so for example, muscle cells are going to take a lot longer to repair than others is because they're constantly undergoing contraction, et cetera. So if we have to have a muscle injury that's going to be repaired, we're going to put you in a sling, and we're going to tell you not to use that arm for a little bit because we don't want you to further damage the tissue by utilizing the muscle, right? Um, nervous tissue also classically poor capacity for renewal, which means that we're not able to correct things like paraplegia because if we have a break in the nervous tissue is very difficult for us to restore nervous function and the nervous tissue doesn't typically regenerate or if it does it regenerates very very slowly um, what reproduces quickly though are fibro fibrotic tissue so we're going to end up with scars forming if we have muscles or um, or skin cells that are going to be damaged and we need a quick and dirty repair mechanism so we can end up with scarring again fibrosis which occurs when the fibroblast cells, which again, they're, they're quick and dirty carpenters, but they don't do a great job, right? So that's how scar tissue forms, um, which can cause adhesions, et cetera. 
We're not going to go about aging or disorders. We're not going to talk about um, development with the exception of the development chapter. So there will be development questions at the very, very end. But anything that you read here in the reviews, yes, you want to brush up on because we do talk about development, but we will not have any development on the 151 section. Right, that has its own place, but I do put it, I leave it in here just to kind of go over it. Um, okay, so now we're talking about the integumentary in <laughs> system, right? Hair, skin, and nails, slide 50. And the integumentary system has the main function of protection from the external environment as well as maintenance of temperature. So if we end up seeing someone who has lost a lot of skin to, for example, a car crash, a motorcycle victim that has had a um, road rash or something like that, we want to make sure that one of our primary concerns on scene is temperature regulation because they now have lost a good bit of their dermis and the dermis is responsible for maintenance of temperature. Um, let's see, so the structure of the skin are going to include the dermis and the epidermis, and underneath the dermal layer, we have a, a layer that's called the hypodermis, which is the subcutaneous layer. We also hear it called the sub-Q. This is not going to be a part of the skin. It's going to have layers of fat tissue and areolar tissue. It's going to be like if you were to pull the skin off of a chicken, this is what you're pulling off, is you're breaking off the hypodermis layer, separating out the dermis and the epidermis from the sub-Q layer. Okay, so again, the epidermis is the external layer, and there are multiple different types of cells that can be found inside this external layer, including keratinocytes, which are going to create keratin. Keratin is a structural molecule that's very strong, going to help protect it from things like abrasions and heat. It's also water repellent, so if water falls on your skin, it will not be absorbed. Um, we have melanocytes. Melanocytes are going to create melanin. We're going to create more of this if we're exposed to UV light or less if we're not exposed to UV light, but we all have a genetic predisposition to how much we are going to create, which is going to give us our skin tone or skin color. We have macrophages, which are going to be part of our immune response. Remember, they're going to go out and attack any foreign invaders and kill them. Uh, we have epithelial cells or Merkel cells. These guys are going to be tactile cells that are going to help create sensation. You may have done this in lab where you took uh, two little pins and gave yourself a poke on the skin and you can feel it as two until you get to a certain point where you're in the same tactile disc and even though you're hitting with two, you're only going to feel one sensation because you're only initiating that one nerve re relay. Um, there are four major layers of the epidermis everywhere except your hands and your feet. The soles of your hand, oh, sorry, the palms of your hands and your soles of your feet have a fifth additional layer. Um, from deepest to most superficial, and you will need to know these layers and know which ones are reproducing, which ones are dying, which ones are dead, right? Um, the stratum-based cell, or is the one that's going to be creating cells, then we have the stratum spinosum, one layer above that, stratum granulosum. If we're going to add that fifth layer in, like the palms and the soles, it's stratum lucidium, so this is a totally fair game question. In the soles of your feet, you have an additional layer. What is the name of that additional layer of skin? Stratum lucidium. And the very top layer that's found everywhere is going to be the stratum corneum. Okay, um, I just kind of went over it. I'm not going to give you, but you do need to know. So I'm just kind of scrolling through here until we get to, um, we're on page 52 now. All right, so the epidermis is going to be the outer layer, and it's going to be grow in a specific section. So basically it's going to um, have the, what's called the keratinization, and then we're going to have the growth of the keratinized cells. And as they move up the layers, they become more and more dead, but stronger and stronger and stronger, so they're going to be able to connect to each other as we move up. Um, the dermis is the layer underneath the epidermis. It's connective tissue. It has collagen fiber. It has elastin fiber. It's going to have blood supply, so we're going to have um, papillae, corpuscles of touch, and free nerve endings, so all of a sudden we're going to be able to feel. So in the epidermis, we can't feel, and we, so we don't have any vasculature, and we don't have any blood supply, but if you cut yourself deep enough that you hit the dermis, then you will bleed because we're going to have blood supply there. We also have ridges called the epidermal ridges, which are going to come up with the dermal ridges, and the epidermal ridges interact downward. This is going to allow us grasping ability, and this is where we get our fingerprints and our um, footprints from. So the epidermal ridges aren't just on the top, but they actually are going to go into the dermal layer too and create what's called dermal papillae. Um, so we're going to basically have a three-dimensional structure that allows us to a, grasp on the top side, that epidermal ridge on the bottom side of the epidermal layer. We're going to have the dermal papillae, which go into the dermal layer and provide, if you've ever pulled a, a hangnail or whatever, and you look down and you see that you have kind of three-dimensional structures inside there, those are the dermal papillae. Um, okay, so 
Our skin color comes from the amount of melan melanin we have in our skin and the amount of carotene. So carotene is going to be kind of orange. Melanin is going to be kind of light or dark. And then hemoglobin, which is going to be a reddish color. All those are going to be the pigments that are provide the color to our skin, right? Um, let's see. What we need to talk about. Let's talk about some accessory structures. Sure, hair, skin, and nails. I'm on side 54 now. So hair are going to be found on most skin. Hair is not found on skin that is on the palms or on the soles of the feet because it can't implant into that fifth layer that's not found in the regular skin. So hair can be found in all of the skin that is not going to be considered thick skin. It's found in thin skin, also known as hairy skin. Hair is going to have the shaft above the surface as well as a root that penetrates down. It's going to go into the sub Q layer. Inside there, we have three layers of cells, the medulla, which is the center, then we're gonna have the cortex, and then the cuticle, or the outermost layer. And again, we've always seen the medulla as the center and the cortex as the outer layer, so that should seem very familiar. We've seen this lots of places at this point, including lymph nodes and the ovaries and um, all sorts of locations, the adrenal medulla glands, yada, yada. Um, Okay, still scrolling through different types of hair. So uh, the hair that covers the fetus is called lanugo. We may have just talked about that when we were doing reproduction. It will fall off at birth. It'll stick around for just a couple days to a week and eventually shed off, but it's gonna kind of look like thin wolf hair, usually very, fairly, um, fairly light, but very thin. Um, and then we also have vellus, which is gonna be hair that comes in a couple days later. It's gonna replace the lanugo. And then eventually we're gonna end up with the regular hair, which is the pigmented hair that it comes for your head and your eyelashes and your eyebrows. Hair color is gonna be responsive to the amount of melanin that you have. Um, and as we get older, we're going to end up with grayer hair or whiter hair because the melanocytes are going to stop working in our, in our scalp. Unfortunately, they're gonna to continue to work on our face. So we're gonna end up with age spots because we have melanocytes that are overworking there but are not working well inside our hair follicles. Um, pregnant women might see a resurgence of coloring in their hair because pregnancy is gonna restore melanin production for a little bit. So a pregnant woman might have gray hair, get pregnant, have a nine months of so or so of dark hair and then go gray again. Um, all right, different types of glands. We have oil glands, sweat glands, um, different types of sweat glands, sudoriferous sweat glands that are going to um, be subdivided into, again, apocrine or ecrine. So ecrine sweat glands are going to basically be when the ducts are going to come at the pores of the surface. Apocrine sweat glands are going to secrete via exocytosis and open up into hair follicles. So as the hair follicle moves out, it's going to be bringing with it some sweat. This is why even if you're not actively sweating, if you wait three days, your hair gets greasy automatically. It's not that you put the grease there. The grease comes out of the apocrine glands as the hair is protruding out of the head, which is why the grease is going to accumulate mainly at the top part and not at the ends, right? Your ends are still going to be dry um, because that's where it's coming out of. The Ceremonous glands are going to create ceramin. They're going to be found inside the ear canal or the external auditory meatus is what you're going to be pulling out with your Q-tips, although you probably aren't supposed to use Q-tips. People also use candeline, et cetera. And just as a side note, if you're ever dealing with a geriatric population and you believe that you have hearing loss, it might not necessarily be hearing loss, although it might, but it might be a buildup of ceramin or earwax. And if we remove this big bulbous of solid wax, the hearing might become better. So oftentimes this will be overlooked because people will just say, oh, they're getting older they're losing their hearing but really they've got a blockage you remove it and their hearing is restored or at least partially restored um, nails are gonna also be made of keratin these guys are gonna be found in your fingers and toes major parts are gonna include the body the root and the free edge um, the little white part is called the luna, l lunella um, the cuticle is called the epiconium that's this region that lines the entire it's gonna adhere to the margin of the nail wall um, the hypoconium is going to be a region that secures the nail to the fingertip. And then the nail matrix is where the nail is growing from. And I believe the question that I asked regarding nails has to do with the nail matrix. Don't quote me on that. But the nail growth comes from the nail matrix, which is in the nail bed underneath the skin plate. Okay? Um, and this is how we're going to create new males. And as we enter into different stages of life, nail production will increase or decrease at different rates. So as we get older, nails might become more brittle. Um, during pregnancy, hair and nails might grow really well. Um, so the nail growth is not necessarily going to be created equal among all people. Let's see, different types of skin. We have thin skin and thick skin. I talked about the thick skin having stratum lucidium. It's going to also include our epidermal ridges. This is where we get fingerprints and toe prints from. But we do not have hair. 
or recti pilar muscles, which are connected to the hair to help us with goosebumps. So another question might be, hey, when you're feeling chilly and you get goosebumps, what is it that's going to cause the hair to stand erect? And that is these erector pili muscles. Um, and then thick skin is also gonna have more sweat glands than thin skin as well. Okay. Um, so what's the purpose of the skin? Involved in the regulation of temperature, right? So as I mentioned, if you see someone who is suffering from road rash or has skin loss from a burn or something, you A, later on, are going to be worried about infection, so the immune system, right? So you're going to want to make sure that you're giving them antibiotics, et cetera. But on the immediate, you're going to be worried about thermoregulation. It's also going to serve as a blood reservoir. It's going to contain about 10% of the total blood flow in, blood flow in a resting adult. And again, it's your clinical protection against physical and chemical attack and biological attack. So it's going to basically provide a separation between the external environment and the internal environment. It's also going to provide cutaneous sensation, so the ability to detect touch. We have a lot of different types of touch, right? We have pressure, we have vibration, we have heat, we have tickle, we have cold, we have pain. We talked about a cat jumping up on our lap and purring as well as scratching and how it had heat and how it had vibrations. So you have a lot of different types of sensation that you can get through your cutaneous sensations. The skin's also going to excrete and absorb eliminate waste from the body, as well as things like sweat, et cetera. And it's gonna be the location where we're gonna be synthesizing vitamin D from precursors. This is gonna happen in the presence of UV light. Um, this is gonna help us activate or create calcitriol, which is the activated version of vitamin D. How does skin heal? Well, we have two different layers of skin, the dermis and the epidermis. If we've only injured the epidermis, then epidermal wounds are gonna be repaired by enlargement and migration of basal cells along the epidermis. This typically is not going to involve scarring. If we have deep wound healing, then we're going to have to bring in those fibroblasts to be able to help heal the deep wound. We have a proliferative phase where we're gonna have things migrate in, and then the maturation phase where we're going to have the scab removing, the epidermis is gonna be um, restoring, et cetera. So the proliferative phase is gonna happen during the deep wound healing, and then we have a maturation phase, and usually we might see fibrosis or the creation of scar tissue because we have called in fibroblasts here during that migratory phase. Remember, fibroblasts are great construction workers, but they don't do a good job. They're really fast, they come very, they show up on time and they get a lot of work done, but they don't do the work in a great fashion, and so eventually we're going to end up with scar tissue from this. Okay, um, again, we're not going to talk about development except when we get to the development section, so while we will touch on this, we will touch on this at the very end of 152. Okay, um, I'm going to skip through most of that. Let's, we're now heading into bones. All right, so this is going to be um, page 60. We'll talk about the skeletal system. So. Bone is going to be made up of multiple different types of tissues, including bone tissue, cartilage tissue, connective tissue, epithelial tissue, etc. It also is going to um, have adipose tissue and nervous tissue involved. So bone is going to basically be its own individual organ comprised with all of the rest of these things like cartilage, tendons, etc., creating what we call the skeletal system. What's the point of the skeletal system? The point of the skeletal system is voluntary motion. Right? It's also going to be the site where we're creating red blood cells, so erythropoiesis. Um, bones are also going to be the site of mineral storage and um, release, so things like calcium and phosphorus. Remember, we talked extensively about the bone bank and how it changes as we enter into um, elderly years and that get osteoporotic conditions. Um, so again, it's creation of blood cells, hemopoiesis or erythropoiesis, and it's also going to be an area where we store our fat, so our yellow marrow of our bones is going to store um, triglycerides. So when we look at a long bone, and a long bone would, example would be like our humerus, for example, or our femur, or our tib-fib. We have lots of different types of bones, but long bones are going to be the bones that comprise our appendages. Um, and we have multiple different parts, right? The shaft of this is going to be called the diphesis, and then on the ends we're going to have the epiphesis, and separating out the diphesis and the epiphesis are going to be the metaphesis, which are going to be the areas in between. And we have hyaline, car hyaline cartilage or articular cartilage that's going to be found on either ends of the bones to reduce friction when articulating bones are going to come in contact with each other and also absorb shock at joints that are freely movable. So if you were to like jump and land, it's going to not have bouncing of the bones because we have the cartilage as well as synovial fluid that will be present at those joints. Um, we have the periosteum, which is connective tissue covering the surface of the bone that's going to then connect with. Um, so it's an attachment point for things like ligaments and tendons. Remember, the ligaments are going to connect bone to bone. Tendons are going to connect bone to muscle. 
Um, and then inside the diaphesis, we have a medullary cavity, also known as the marrow cavity. This is going to have yellow marrow as well as the site of um, red blood cell creation. So blood, um, blood vessels are going to be found inside here. And the lining of the medullary cavity is called the endosteum. So the endosteum is going to line the entire cavity and is going to help keep the marrow inside, essentially. Um, and we have the periosteum on the outside. So the endosteum is going to line the inside. The periosteum is going to line the outside. And it's a connective tissue layer that lines the entire bone that then is going to become synonymous with the ligaments or the tendons or whatever connective tissue we need. All right, so if we look at the histology of bone, we're going to see four major types of bone cells. Um, osteoprogenitor cells are going to basically be the ones that are developing into osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are the cells that build bone. So blasts build up. Right? Um, blasts are going to secrete collagen and initiate calcification or the ossification of the bone. And then we also have oste um, osteocytes, which are going to help maintain bone tissue. These are osteoblasts that have fully matured. So osteoblasts are the, like the I don't know, middle-aged, and osteocytes are the ones that have found their, their final maturation state. We also have osteoclasts, and osteoclasts are going to help break things down. Basically, they're caching out, so blasts build up, and see calcium is removed or ca cash out. I'm not sure exactly how you crack it, but clasts are going to be the ones that are removing the money from the bone bank, and um, osteoblasts are the ones that are putting the money into the bone bank. As we get older, the ratio of blasts to clasts becomes different. We're going to still have bone um, taking the money out, so we're still going to be taking money out of the bank, but maybe not putting the money into the bank as quickly or as often as we used to as we get older, which causes, again, osteoporotic conditions where we start just pulling away from the structure and end up with it being very weak. Um, all right. So again, osteoclasts are the ones that, that are going to be breaking down the bone tissue. We have two different types of bone, compact bone and spongy bone. Compact bone is going to be arranged in osteons. Osteons have our vasculature, like blood vessels. It also has lymphatic tissue, nervous tissue, et cetera. Um, these guys are going to basically be layers of lamellae. Again, this is what looks like tree trunk rings that are going to be found in concentric rings. Um, and time and space inside that is going to be called the lacunae, right? So holes inside. And we saw lacunae again when we talk about the creation of the placenta, right? Lacunae is just going to be holes in a series of cells that can be utilized for whatever we want. In the case of the placenta, we'll be putting the maternal blood supply into the sinusoids. Here, we'll be utilizing this for bone remodeling or bone growth or whatever. Um, okay, spongy bone is what's called cancellous bone. It does not have osteons, and it has what's called trabiculae. Trabiculae are going to be large regions of non-bone, just kind of absence of space. Um, and we're going to have red marrow filling the spaces as well. It's going to make most of the interior structure of our bone. So the external part is going to be compact bone, nice and strong. The interior part is going to be, um, especially the, the flat bones, the irregular bones, etc., and also the core of the long bones. Um, spongy bone is very light, so it's not going to be as dense as the compact bone, so it's going to allow us to be able to have um, less weight to our bones, and it's also going to provide us with red bone marrow, which is the site of urethropoiesis or hematopoiesis, or the creation of red blood cells, right? Okay, so bones are going to be supplied heavily with blood and with nervous tissue. The arterial supply is going to include the periosteal arteries, which are going to go to the periosteum or the outer part of the bone. They're going to enter into the diaphesis through what's called Volkmann's can um, canals. And then we also are going to have a nutrient artery which passes through the center part of the diaphesis through what's called the nutrient canal. And this is going to supply blood supply to the inside of the bone. And then we also are going to have arteries that enter into the epiphyseal region and the metaphyseal region called epiphyseal and metaphyseal arteries. When we looked at the structures of these bones, which I don't have depicted here, but if you go back to the PowerPoints and follow along, you'll be seeing that we have no crosstalk between the epiphyseal and the, uh, and, um, the metaphyseal regions because these are going to be where the growth plate separates out. So growth is going to be headed in both directions. So we're not going to, we're going to need separate nervous tissue, separate blood supply for this region as for that region. So we're going to have our own epiphyseal epiphyseal and metaphyseal arteries. Same thing with vascular, with the venous re, um, return. Epiphyseal and metaphyseal veins are going to come from the epiphyseum and metaphyseal regions. And periosteal veins are going to come out of the periosteum. So these all seem like pretty obvious names. Um, as bone is formed, we're going to start with cartilage, and it's going to ossify. 
into bone, right? So it's called osteogenesis or ossification. And we start off with mesenchymal cells that are gonna become our scaffolding. And then we're going to start replacing the inside of those cells with things like calcium and phosphorus and magnesium, making them hard and mineral-like. Um, we're basically gonna be forming bone inside this um, endochondrial region, okay? Um, and let's see. So this part here is talking about intramembranous ossification versus endochondral ossification. So I was just originally talking about endochondral ossification. We're starting with cartilage, and we're going to have it replaced by bone. So that's level C. But if I'm going to scroll up to B, intramembranous ossification happens when we're making the flat bones, like the facial bones, like the also the clavicle and the mandible or the jaw. Basically what happens is we're going to start with a region, the, the ossification center or the beginning of the bone, and we're going to have mesenchymal cells come in here and start differentiating into what are first progenitor cells called osteoprogenitor cells and then into osteoblasts from our osteoblasts build bone and they're going to lay down the extracellular matrix which is then going to end up being calcified in right and as we're calcifying this matrix the blast is going to mature into an osteocyte right so that's how we're going to make our flat bones but we also are going to have endochondrial ossification which is we're going to start with cartilage and have that ossify into bone, and that's how the rest of the bones in the body are created. Um, again, with the primary ossification center developing, that's then going to have, um, have mineralization happen, where we're going to be forming the second ossification center and eventually getting epiphyseal plates. Remember, the epiphyseal growth plate separates out the epiphysium and the metaphysium, and that's going to be where we are actually going to be creating. So we're going to be pushing from both directions. We're making new cartilage. That cartilage is then going to have large holes in it. And as it becomes holier or larger with the holes, we're going to fill that in with calcium and mineralization. Okay, so again, it's going to be replaced. And eventually that epiphyseal growth plate, which is wide and dirt while we're growing, will become an epiphyseal line, indicating that that bone has completed its growth and we're not going to see any more height out of this individual. So while bones don't lengthen anymore after a certain age, they can grow in thickness. Um, that's called appositional growth at the periosteum. And this happens if we have direct weight, so it can happen from impact or exercise. I may have given the example of why Simone Biles was told that her move was illegal in the most recent Olympic events, and it's because she fell from too high of a height, so she bounded up two stories into the air and landed down two stories onto her legs, which have been taking this hit for however old she is, right, 20 years. So her legs, because they have had constant impact over and over, have had this ossification event become stronger and stronger and stronger, wider and wider and wider, and they did not break. But the Olympic Committee ruled that it was dangerous for someone else to try to emulate or copy that because if they hadn't undergone impact over impact over 20 years, their bones would not be able to handle a fall from a second story building. So although she nailed that routine, she was not given credit for something that was more difficult than any of the rest of the competition because of the fact that it was deemed to be too difficult for other people to copy. And there's a lot of gymnastics routines that have been removed for safety reasons, but she's the first person to do it for the pact of bone impact. Some of the other reasons have included like cervical fracture, because they would do something where they would arch and have their head at the last minute roll and tuck. But she's the one that has an impact of just too high of a height for it to be humanly possible, even though she did it as a human. But she was able to do it because of this appositional growth where over time and lots and lots of impact, her bones have gotten wider and wider and wider, so they're able to handle or absorb the type of impact that you'd see from a fall from literally a second story building, um, which is how far she actually flung herself in the air, which is truly miraculous too. But anyway, um, so that's appositional growth, how we grow thicker because of this um, impact and impact. Um, so bone remodeling is constantly happening. So as I mentioned, we have osteoblasts and osteoclasts. We are constantly putting money into the bone bank, taking money out of the bone bank all of the time. And as we are in our younger phases, we are either adding more to it than we are taking away or we're keeping it even. As we get older and older, particularly women, postmenopausal women who no longer have hormonal regulation, like um, estrogen regulation of this, they are going to start seeing osteoporotic conditions where we are drawing out of the bone bank, meaning that we have more um, osteoclast cashing the money out than osteoblast putting the money in so we're going to start losing calcium at a higher rate than we're depositing it in um, okay this next one is basically saying that we need to take in a lot of vitamins and minerals in order to have appropriate bone remodeling including vitamins a c d b and um, k i'm not going to quiz you on this so we're going to just roll right on through here um, 
Fracture and repair, there is one question on fracture and repair, so know the difference between the fractures. And the reason that I kept this question in is because as an ER nurse, you are going to see fractures. You're probably going to see fractures even just as an adult human. This will at some point happen in front of you. So a fracture is when a bone is broken. They have multiple different types of fractures. Either it is open or it is closed. What do I mean? The bone is protruding or it is not. In an open or a compound fracture, we have two major concerns. The first immediate concern is hemorrhage. This is a sharp knife, essentially. The bone has broken, it is very sharp, it has sliced through arteries and veins, and very likely this is gonna require a tourniquet um, to make sure that we're not going to have severe hemorrhage. Um, additionally, later on, we're probably gonna be dealing with an infection risk. Why? We had the inside of the bone, the medullary cavity, poke through and then hit the ground. So we introduced external bacteria from the soil directly into the inside of the bone cavity, which is never supposed to see the external environment. And while we do have an immune system to help with this, this is going to be problematic. So we are almost always certainly, as a ER doctor, going to prescribe antibiotics with an open fracture. Now a closed fracture is going to be um, a, a fracture where everything stays inside. That does not mean that we don't have the risk of bleeding. We probably will have internal bleeding as well, um, but it means that we're not going to have the same risk of infection. All right, a comminuted fracture is when we have a ton of little pieces. This is like we've dropped a vase on the ground and we have multiple little shards. This is going to be difficult to heal. We're probably going to want to pull out a couple of those shards, maybe put some screws or some plates in to replace whatever's missing to allow it to heal properly. Um, if we don't do that, all of these little shards will either not resorb back into the bone and become their own little shards, or they can resorb in all awkward shapes, possibly not going to restore back to the original shape of the bone. Um, we also have a, um, things like a green stick fracture, which would be if you picture taking a stick across your leg and have it not breaking all the way, but partially break. We talked about how green stick fractures are particularly dangerous because the green stick fracture is not a broken bone yet, but it is kind of like having a vase drop, like a jelly jar drop, and then the next time that you drop it, it's very easy to break because it has all these little lines in it. But an individual who has a green stick fracture might not know that they are at risk for a real fracture in the future, for a full break in the future. So they might have an injury from like soccer practice or whatever and not get hurt, it might limp around, and then the next day or two days later, step off of their back step wrong and shatter their leg. So this is the kind of thing where a stitch in time saves nine. An individual with a, um, with a green stick fracture really does need to lay off of that leg for a little bit of time, six weeks or so, to allow that bone to heal properly so we don't run the risk of a secondary fracture. So these are kind of risky because oftentimes this individual is still walking around on this broken bone. Or like a mom at a softball practice caught a, bo caught a ball to her hand and her wrist kind of hurts, and she's totally fine until she goes to the gym and starts doing push-ups, and it snaps because it has already had some sort of break before. Um, an impacted fracture is going to be whenever the bone is going to have gone inside the bone beneath it. So we're in, we might lose length in this bone. So for example, we have a child has fallen like this on their elbow and now this arm is actually half the length of this arm but twice as wide because the bones have gone either like this or actually inside the medullary cavity of the one beneath it causing impaction. This is going to require an individual pulling this out. So this could be on site. You require you to actually hold the individual at the knee and pull the hip joint to be able to restore the length to the bone and then get it. So in a triage situation, before we're going to get it onto a, um, a stretcher, we might have to elongate this bone to get it back into location. Um, all right, so there's the different types of fractures. Fractures are going to have to undergo a repair. The first thing that's going to happen is what's called a fracture hematoma. Remember, we got a lot of blood supply and a lot of nervous supply. So a broken bone is going to really hurt, right? But we have a lot of blood supply here, and the blood supply is going to end up being pooled inside the medullary cavity. And if we haven't ruptured the periosteum, it's going to pool under the periosteum as well. So this is going to form like this little region around it that can help create what is going to be the um, cartilaginous callus. So we're going to have the hematoma, the blood, be replaced by cartilage. And then that cartilage is going to be converted into spongy bone, making a hard callus. So we go from a hematoma to a soft callus to a hard callus. And then finally, that callus is going to be remodeled and shaped down and reshaped to hopefully realign everything into the original shape, right? Um, so let's see. Um.
Basically, our treatment for fracture is going to be immobilization. We can also have surgeries. We might put in plates or pins. Um, we might have to do a reduction where we remove some of the bone fragments or put the bone fragments back in the right place, like try to put the mosaics back in the puzzle. Um, but typically what we're going to do is going to be an immobilization. We can do this with a cast. We can do external fixation. There's a couple different ways. So external fixation would be if we're actually holding um, like metal around it with pins that go in while we're waiting for healing. Um, or we might go and do an internal fixation where we slide in a titanium rod and some screws and some plates or something like that. Um, the bone plays a large role in b the bone bank, right? Mineral homeostasis, so in calcium homeostasis and um, phosphorus, et cetera, and we're going to regulate that via the endocrine system utilizing the parathyroid hormone and the and calcitonin, which are both going to be secreted by the parathyroid and the, uh, the thyroid gland, again, part of the endocrine system. And these guys have pretty nice negative feedback loops, which I went over in class and you guys should familiarize yourself with, but basically if we end up with too much calcium, we bring it back down by regulating the levels of um, calcitonin. Right? So if we have too high, we bring more calcitonin in to help it bring low. If we have too low, we bring more parathyroid in because it's going to help increase the blood calcium. So we utilize these two constantly to help make sure that we are getting the supply that we need to the cells. All right. Sorry, I have to take a break and grab my charger because it's going to yell at me. So I am currently on slide six or page 66. We're talking about exercise and bone tissue. Um, so as I mentioned with the Simone Biles thing, that if we are able to have multiple repeated impacts on the bones, this will make the bones stronger and wider and able to take more impact. So the bone's actually able to alter its strength in response to mechanical stress by adding more mineral salts. Um, and if we are, for example, um, not doing weight-bearing activities, like we're on the International Space Station and we're not exercising properly, when they come back from the International Space Station, they will oftentimes, because they have reduced gravity, they don't have the same impact on their bones. Um, so unless they do weighted exercises, which they now do, but they didn't used to, they're going to come back um, and have to undergo severe rehabilitation to be able to handle their own weight again. Same thing with someone who's been in a coma for a while, hasn't utilized their muscles or their bones. So removing of mechanical stress is actually weakening the bone by getting rid of minerals and adding mechanical stress strengthens the bone by adding minerals to it, right? Okay, so I'm moving on to, um, oh, I must have doubled this. Sorry guys. So I doubled the integumentary system. I apologize. I already did that. Okay, good. So good. I was like, it's 150 pages. How is it that long? So I apologize. Okay, so now we're on to um, axial skeleton. You're right. I did double up bones. So I guess I'm currently on page 85. Is that where you ladies are too? Okay, so axial skeleton is basically going to be um, all of the skeleton that does not include the appendages. And before we go into the axial skeleton, I want to talk about some bone surface markings that we're going to be utilizing here. So these are some of the terms that you are absolutely going to know. These you should already know, right? Fissure is going to be a slit. A foramen is a hole. The foramen magnum is the largest hole. It's going to be in the skull. Fossa is a depression. Sulcus is a groove. Meatus is a tube, like the auditory meatus. Um, so you should know all of these terms pretty much in and out by now. And you should actually be able to immediately come up with an example of each one of these by the fact that we've touched the bones multiple times. Um, and when we talk about joints, we're talking about how bones articulate with each other, so how one bone interacts with the other. Um, and that's going to include things like we have condyles, which is going to be a protuberance that is going to extrude outward. We have a facet, which is the articular surface that's going to allow for that. Um, we can also have a, a head, which again might be supported by a neck. We would have like, like the head of the femur, et cetera. And then we also have multiple processes that form connective tissue attachment points. Again, they're all listed here, crest, epicondyl, spinous process. And by this point, you should not only know what they mean, but you should give me an example of each without even really thinking. So if you're not able to do that, then you should be restudying some of these bones. Um, again, I'm probably only going to give you one or two questions out of here, but this is something that will recur for sure when you go into your nursing program. So if you don't know the bones and all the 
bone surface markings, then please take the time to brush up on that. Um, so we're going to hop into the cranial bones first, which are going to be the bones that create the head. They're going to surround and protect the brain. Um, most of these are going to be paired bones. They're not all paired bones, but almost all of them are going to have a left and a right version of the same bone. Obviously, the exception here, the frontal bone, which is going to be your forehead. The parietal bones are going to be paired left and right. Same thing with the temporal bones. Um, some of the things that you'll need to know about the temporal bones, things, uh, things like um, the zygomatic process, which is going to be part of the zygomatic arch, which produces your cheekbones, so zygomatic as the cheeks. Uh, mastoid process is going to extend out so that the sternocleomastoid muscle can attach to it. This is going to allow us uh, mastication or chewing. Um, we also are going to have the external auditory meatus, which is going to be the area that's going to connect to the eardrum. So it's going to be a hole that goes all the way through our head into the eardrum. And then we have the styloid process, which is going to be attachment points for ligaments and muscles, et cetera. Um, the occipital bone is towards the back. It's going to form the base of the back of the cranium. It's also going to be where we have the largest hole in the body. That's the foramen magnum. It also has occipital condyles, which are going to allow us to connect the skull to the first cervical, cervical vertebrae. Um, we have the sphenoid bone, which is going to be where all of these other facial bones connect. It's going to form the middle part of the base of the skull. And it's going to be one of the four sets of the sinuses in the head. So we have the sphenoid sinuses, the frontal sinuses, the ethmoid sinuses, and the maxillary sinuses. Um, that's my bone. Again, also an area where we're going to have sinuses. These guys are going to be, uh, it's going to have multiple different regions, including a perpendicular plate that's going to help form the nasal septum going to be the area where the superior middle nasal conchi are going to be formed. Remember, this is where we're going to have air intake through the nasal cavities. The first thing we're going to be doing here is warming the air, filtering the air with little hairs, as well as moistening the air so it doesn't dry out our throats. We also have the cribiform plate, which we talked about extensively when we talked about olfaction. Right? So this is how we're going to be able to have the sense of, um, of smell. The olfactory nerves are going to basically go across so when a little particulate matter lands on the nasal epithelium and then it's going to get dissolved into the nasal mucus. It's then going to go across the cribiform plate through the olfactory nerve into the brain, giving us a sensation of smell. Um, the facial bones are going to form the face. You should be familiar with all of them. Again, most of them are going to be paired, but not all of them, right? The vomer is not paired, for example. Um, the maxilla is not paired either. Um, the maxilla is the upper jawbone, mandible is the lower jawbone. Um, a, there's regions of that that you should know. The body is going to be the curved part. The ramus is the part um, that's going to be the, basically the ascending branch part. And the angle is going to be the quarter where the body meets the ramus. It's going to give that nice jaw line that's going to give you a like Clint Eastwood look or whatnot. Um, then we're going to have the condylar process, which is going to form a joint up with the temporal bone, as well as the coracoid process coronoid process, which is going to form an attachment point for the temporalis muscle. So you will need to know not only all the facial bones, but some of their surface markings as well. Okay. Um, so the nasal septum is basically going to be including the vomer, as well as the cartilage from the septal region, as well as the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, which is going to articulate with the vomer to create this nasal septum. Um, the eye socket is going to be comprised of multiple different bones, including the frontal bone, sphenoid bone, ethmoid bone, palatine bone, etc. So lots of bones are going to come together to form this orbit. Um, and then anytime that we have a joint that is immovable, it's going to be called a suture. We have a lot of sutures in our skull bones. Remember when we were born as an infant, we had a lot of space in between there that's going to allow those bones to actually overlap, to be pushed through the vaginal cavity, right, through the pelvic bone. And then all of a sudden those bones are gonna merge together and form joints, but these are joints that are gonna be solid joints that are immovable and they're gonna be called sutures. So we have a coronal suture between the frontal and the parietal, it goes like this. We have a sagittal between the two parietal. We have a lamboid between the occipital and parietal, and a squamous between the temporal and parietal. And remember, there's images for all of this. You should be able to, you should know all of these. We also have multiple different sinuses, right? Sphenoid, ethmoid, maxillary, um, frontal sphenoid, ethmoid, and maxillary sinuses. Fontanelles are going to be spaces in the infant that are not going to be fused so that we're able to have delivery through the, again, through the pelvic section, so the head's actually going to have to be a little bit squished, meaning the bones are going to have to overlap. And we have four major fontanelles, the anterior, posterior, anterolateral, and posterolateral fontanelles, which are going to fuse into cranial bones and eventually become sutures. Some of them are going to fill in and become their own bone. Hyoid bone is the only free floating, floating bone in the body. 
going to be located in the throat and the anterior neck between the mandible and the larynx. It's going to connect to the temporal bones via the styloid process. And it's going to be the attachment point for your, or your tongue, neck, and pharynx muscles. OK, vertebral columns. Now this, um, I want you to know the difference for sure between the cervical, thoracic, and the lumbar columns. I should be able to give you a vertebrae and maybe not ask you which of the thoracic vertebrae it is, but you should be able to identify that it's thoracic and not lumbar, or that it's lumbar and not cervical, right? Both by size and by different things that have been added to them. So you should be able to tell me which of the major regions of the spine the vertebrae that I handed you came to. Keep in mind the top two, C1 atlas and C2 axis are going to have very unique morphology. You'll be able to tell these apart from all of the rest of them for a couple of reasons. Remember the C1 is not going, it's gonna have a different attachment point to the head, so it's not going to have um, the way that we have spinous process that stick off all the rest of them. That's going to allow us to take our head all the way back without catching. Whereas if we did have that spinous process, it would catch on the top of our, our um, occipital bones. Um, and then axis has a special connection to C1, which is called the odontoid process. So the atlas can rotate, which allows us to do this. I know those at home can't see it, but I'm looking left and right. So axis has a special connection to atlas, which allows axis, uh, atlas rotational capacity, which is a lot greater than the rest of what the spinal column is able to do, right? Okay, we have cervical bones one through C seven, so C1 through C7. One of the questions that I have that is kind of a trick question refers to spinal cord nerve eight, and it asks you where it exits, and one of the answers is between C7 and C8. There is no C8. It exits between C7 and T1. And it's the same thing for thoracic nerve 12. It exits between T12 and L1, if that makes sense, right? So just make sure that you know that there are seven cervical vertebrae. The top two are C1 and C2 are atlas and axis. Know the difference between those two and the rest of the vertebral column. And then know the major differences between the cervical region, the thoracic region, which has rib articulation, so we're going to see costal facets, and we've gotten larger than the cervical bones, and the lumbar, which is not going to have any costal facets, but is going to be much, much larger, and is then going to lead into to the sacrum. Remember the sacrum? It's going to be five vertebrae in children that fuse into one in adults. And the same thing with the coccyx, four vertebrae in children that fuse into one in adults. Now the vertebral column does have natural curves. We have a curve with the cervical region, the thoracic, the lumbar, and the sacral curves. Um, and we are going to have disorders that can be associated with abnormal curves of the vertebral column. Know the difference between these two. There is one question on them. So scoliosis is when we have lateral bending. So we're going to have it that our shoulders and our hips are not going to ever be parallel because they're going to basically be bent one direction or the other. Kyphosis is what you see in elderly people that I'm personally trying to fight where they start doing this. They get like kind of bent over, but then they look up. So the top of this gets like a hunch because they want to see forward, but they're so they do that instead of being able to do this and straighten their shoulders down. Um, and that's going to be kyphosis. And kyphosis is one of those things that progresses and only gets worse and worse and worse as you get older and older. Um, because, of course, you don't want to look at the ground. So you want to look up. And looking up pushes your neck down. And it's just a feed forward problem. Um, all right, intervertebral discs are what are going to separate out your vertebrae. These are going to be your buffers, essentially. We have a fibrocartilage ring that is very strong. It's going to be called the annulus fibrous on the outside and an inner pulpy center that is going to be, um, I don't want to say weak, but it's going to allow for it to have some bounce to it. So it's a pulpy center that allows for absorption of impact. Um, and we can have what's called a herniated disc if this nucleolus pulpus region pops out through the fibrous ring, which can be incredibly painful. What they'll typically do is they will either, at this point, they might be able to replace the disc, but what they used to do would be cadaver bone. They'd pull the disc out, pack it with cadaver bone, and fuse those two together so you were no longer able to have motion there, but you also weren't having extreme, extreme pain or pinching. So people generally, although they lost motion, they were happy to do so because they lose the back pain as well. Um, okay, so the vertebra has multiple regions, including the body, which is the main part that can, has going to hold the weight, the vertebral arch, and that's going to have the region that's going to surround the spinal cord, remember the spinal cord runs through the spinal vertebrae. Then we have pedicles in the back to pro project around the vertebral body, body, and then we have small intervertebral foramina, which is where we're going to allow for the spinal nerves to come out. So small holes in between the vertebrae. 
And we have attachment points for muscles. So spinous and transverse processes allow us to attach muscles so that we're able to move forward and also left and right with our back. And we have articulating processes that are both superior and inferior that are going to articulate with the adjacent vertebrae, right? Now remember, we're not going to have these articular processes um, in C1 and C2 in the same way that we do with the rest because we don't need to articulate with the top if there's nothing above us. Okay, in the thoracic region, our thoracic cage is going to include our rib cage, which will connect in the back to the vertebrae and then connect in the front to what's called the sternum. The sternum is where we're gonna be performing CPR. Remember, we're gonna take our wrist and put it over the other wrist, and we're gonna go straight down on the sternum. Remember, the sternum has three major regions. We wanna do this on the body. We wanna not do it on the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process is this little part here that dangles down. So when they tell you to do CPR, they don't tell you to just reach down, they tell you to put two fingers and then put it. Right, because the xiphoid process won't take your weight, it's just gonna break, and now you've got a nice sharp little knife in there every time you're going up and down, that's no good, we don't really want that. So we're gonna go on what can handle the weight and also what has the costal cartilage to handle the impact, right? The costal cartilage is flexible and is able to bend. So the costal cartilage connects to the ribs, um, uh, and that's going to allow it to connect to the vertebrae in the back, okay? Um, each of the ribs are gonna have major regions, including the head, the neck, the tubercle, and the body, um, as well as the costal cartilage, where we're going to abruptly change curve, uh, sorry, the costal angle, which is going to abruptly change angle, and then the costal cartilage, which is going to attach the ribs directly to the sternum. Again, from about here to here, it's flexible. This allows me to breathe. It's also going to allow me to accept the impact from a CPR right, event, right? Okay, so that's is the axial skeleton. Let's move on to the appendicular skeleton. The appendicular skeleton is going to include all appendages, including the girdles. So we're going to have the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle. Pe pectoral is going to include the shoulder. That includes the clavicle and the scapula. You will need to know all of the major orientations of all of these bones. Again, if not for my class, for your future, this is something that you will come into counter with. So I'm not going to go through all of it now. And again, I'm only going to give you a couple of questions on the exam, but you do need to know all of the different regions that are describing these bones because you're going to be encountering them later on in the nursing program too. Um, okay, so the radius is going to be, radius and the ulna the, um, are going to be in your arms. Sorry, those at home, you can't see me pointing to them. The carpals are your wrist bones. Carpals lead to the metacarpals, um, which are going to be your palm bones, and those lead to your pharynges. Phalanges, yep. Um, go ahead, it's fine, yeah, of course. Um, all right, so as we head down, we're going to end up in our lower extremities. We're going to go from our pelvic hip girdle, which is going to include our coxal bones. Um, that's going to be the ilium, the pubi pubis, and the ischium. These guys are all going to come together to form the acetibulum, which is the socket that's going to merge with the head of the femur. The lower extremities are going to include the femur as the long bone of the, um, the upper part of the leg. The patella is the kneecap. And as we head down, we're going to hit the tibia and the fibula which are going to be your lower leg bones. They're gonna lead into your ankle. It's gonna be several, seven tarsal bones. You do need to know which ones these are. So your heel bone is the calcineus um, or the calcaginus. Um, then we also have the talus, the navicular, the cuboid, and then three of the cuneiforms, which are going to be the first, the second, and the third. These tarsal bones or ankle bones lead into the metatarsals which are gonna be numbered medially to laterally, one to five, just like we see in our metacarpals. And these are gonna articulate with the cuneiform bo bones to make the tarsal metatarsal joint at the ankle and articulate distally with the phalanges to form the metatarsal phalangeal joints. Okay, phalanges are the toes. Um, and we're gonna number them one through five, great toe being one, pinky toe being five. The great toe is called the hallux. The big finger is called the felix. Um, and the great toe is actually going to have um, greater and distal phalanges as well. It only has two, just like we see with the thumb, whereas the other digits are going to have three, just like we see with the fingers, proximal, middle, and distal phalange bones. Um, and the joints between the phalanges are called the intraphalangeal joints. Let's see, arches, we have two of them. We have the longitudinal arch and the transverse arch. The longitudinal arch has two regions, both the medial part and the lateral part. So basically, is it going to be on the inside or the outside of the foot? Um, they're both going to originate at the calcineus. The medial part is going to end at the medial metatarsals. There's, again, three of those. The lateral part is going to end at the lateral metatarsals. Uh, the transverse arch is going to 
be formed by the navicular bones, the cuneiforms, and the bases of the metatarsal bones. And that's going to allow the arch this direction. Um, okay, so that brings us to joints and articulations. This is slide 93. We're going to be talking about how two bones are going to interact with each other, what's the point of contact between these bones. Anytime that we have a contact between two bones, or two or more bones, so we might have a contact of multiple bones, for example, like the eye socket, um, between a cartilage and bone, or between teeth and bones. So a joint can be classified as whether or not, oh, sorry guys, oh, get me out of here, sorry. The joint can be classified as whether or not, there we go. Um, whether or not it has motion. So a degree of motion permitted. Is it freely movable? Is it kind of movable? Or is it not movable at all? So if it's freely movable, that's called a dithrosis. Um, partially movable, amphiothrosis, amphiarthrosis, and a synarthrosis is going to be completely immovable, like um, a suture. Fibrous joints are going to be when we do not have a synovial cavity. We're held together by dense connective tissue. We have very little motion. Good examples of this are going to include sutures, like between the head bones. Um, syndesmosis or interosseous membranes. Um, a good example of, the, of this is going to be like the tibiofibular ligament, which allows a little bit of motion, but not a lot. Another example of a syndesmosis joint is what's called a gomphosis, which is when our tooth is going to interact with our bone in the socket. So the root of the tooth inside its socket is going to be called a gomphosis, which is an example of a syndesmosis. Okay, joints can also be cartilaginous or synovial, a cartilaginous joint does not have a synovial cavity. We are going to have cartilage on the articulating bones. Um, we have two different types of these. We have synchondrosis and symphysis, or symphysis. Um, symphysis is plural, symphysis is singular. A good example of a symphysis is going to be like the pubic symphysis, uh, which is going to be when we have two of our pubis bones coming together, but we're going to have a interverbital, like, like a cartilage or a disc in between there. Another example is going to be your intervertebral discs. Um, let's see. Uh, synchondrosis, however, is going to be a cartilaginous joint. The connective material in this case is going to be hyaline cartilage, which does not allow very much motion. A good example of that is the epiphyseal growth plate in between the epiphysium and the metaphysium. So when this bone elongation ceases, we're just going to end up with bone replacing or ossification of that hyaline cartilage. And what was a synchondrosis or a growth area is now become going to become a synostosis or an area where we're stopped growing and we have a nice tight line between those two. Um, and synovial joints are going to be similar, but we're going to end up, so we do have articulating cartilage, but we're going to also have synovial fluid. So we're going to have an articular capsule that lines this whole region and is going to enclose a synovial cavity in uniting these articulating bones and is going to then have fluid present, so synovial fluid which is created by the synovial membrane, by cells called synovial sites, which is going to serve to lubricate and reduce friction in this joint and also to help absorb some impact, as well as supplying nutrients and removing metabolic waste from the joint as well. Okay. Um, what types of motions are we able to have at synovial joints? If we are able to move, we can have multiple different types of motions. We can have motion that's gliding back and forth. For example, the wrist allows us to do this. If you picture the pageant queen wave, um, we can have angular motions that allow us to change the um, angle of the way the two bones articulate. So if the decrease, if the angle is going to decrease in the bones, that's a flexion. If the angle is going to increase between the bones, that's called an extension. And we talked a lot about extension, examples of extension, and examples of flexion. And we can sometimes have hyperextension. Some joints are meant to hyperextend. Like, for example, your wrist is able to hyperextend, no problem, but your elbow and your knee joints are not able to hyperextend. We also referred to whether or not the motion is going to go away from or close to the midline. If we're going away from the midline, that's going to be called abduction. If we're coming towards the midline, that's called adduction. And if we're moving in a circle, that's called circumduction. We can also have rotation when we're moving around a longitudinal axis and specialty motions that occur um, when we are moving things up or down, for example, like your jaw can be elevated or depressed, or your jaw can also move forward or pull back. That's protraction or retraction. Um, another example of things are like inversion and eversion, when your ankles are going to go inward or outward. These are typically going to be associated with um, injuries, so you can have extreme eversions, which would be a twisted ankle, or extreme inversion, which would be a twisted ankle as well. So although these are normal motions, if we take them too far, we can call them, it can cause an injury, right? Um, and dorsiflexion is basically when we are bending the foot towards the direction of the superior surface. 